Amen, amen. You about ready to go to God's word. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, so today we're starting a brand new series called Christ the Victor. Um, Christ the Victor, um, it comes from this, uh, this old Latin phrase, Christus Victor, and um, it just means Christ the Victor. And it's a perspective on the cross. And so we're going to be looking at one perspective on what did God do at the cross of Jesus Christ? When he died, usually when people are new to Christianity, they're like, why did Jesus die? Why did he lose? Why, why was he defeated? And the short answer is he wasn't. Through his death, he won. Through his defeat, he was victorious. And so Christus Victor is a, is a way of looking at the cross and trying to understand that Jesus on the cross actually won the war. Amen. I'm like, well, wait a second. What war? The war between God and Satan. The enemy. Now, there are other, the, the academics call them theories of the atonement, and I'm not going to go into all of those. I'll just say, if you've got to choose a theory of the atonement, I choose all of the above, because I think they're all there personally. But we're going to look at Christus Victor today and next week. So today, specifically, Jesus is going to defeat the enemy. Next week on Easter, we're going to look at the way that Jesus defeated sin and death. So three things get defeated. So in order to understand that, I'm going to have to tell you the big story from Genesis to Revelation of the war, the great war. You ready for this? So I'm going to read lots of verses to you today. When I say lots of verses, it's, it's maybe more verses than you've ever looked at before. Um, may, maybe more than you've ever heard in a sermon before, but it's a whole lot of verses. And it's all about Satan against God. And, and, and in order to talk about that, I just need to admit to you, we're going to talk about Satan today. The devil. And for some of you in church, you're not used to a lot of talk about Satan or the devil. Or some of you have been in churches where maybe you talked about Satan and the devil a little too much. I, I think there's two extremes out there, actually. But if you're not comfortable with this kind of talk today, I, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to move right past that. Um, so if, if, if you're in need of a message that really looks at the idea of does Satan even exist, I just want to direct you to a message that we gave last November. It was part of the You Asked For It series called Spiritual Warfare, and I spend a lot of time talking about why we believe the devil exists, and we talk a lot about how to engage as a believer in Jesus in warfare against him. So all those practicals, all that teaching is there, and I'm skipping over all of that today. Day. I'm just going to tell you who he is. God created angels, spirit beings in their own dimension, and you can't see them, but they are there. Their, their, their dimension is overlaid with our practical earthly dimension. So they are always there, yet they are invisible. There are a lot of them. I'll just tell you that. Some, one scripture seems to indicate there might be a hundred million angels or more. You're like, well, that's a lot. I know it's a lot. There might even be more than that. We don't know the exact number of angels that were created by God, but there are some scriptures that indicate that every single child, even in our overpopulated world right now, they all have, Jesus said, their angel kind of watching over them. That's in the scripture. And so there must be a lot of them. Now I say that because sometimes when you don't see something, what you assume is A, it doesn't exist, or B, it's really rare. Neither is true. Amen. The spirit realm is there. It is well populated and it is ancient and it is highly organized. So this is uh, uh, Ephesians chapter six says our battle is not against just flesh and blood people, but it is against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, when Paul said that in Ephesians 6, why didn't he just say, we have a battle against the devils? Why did he say, rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What he's trying to do is he's trying to help you understand just how numerous and how highly organized they are. This is Christian teaching. 
It's hard to get around this. So Satan is a fallen angel. He led a rebellion against God in heaven. And when he led that rebellion, he took, as the scripture says, a third of the angels with him. And they were not cast to hell like Hollywood told you. They were cast down to earth. There's a lot of things that Hollywood isn't so much right about. We're going to take you back to the scripture and teach you all about that. And you're like, it's Easter. Why are we talking about Satan? Because he's the one Jesus defeated on the cross. So I got to lead you to all of that. Um, Just a quick thing on the existence of Satan. Why why do we believe in him? Um, Number one is because the Bible says so. If you want to have a consistent faith, I'll say it again. If you want to have a consistent faith, you're going to go to your scripture. You're going to believe all that God has revealed to us. You can't just go and cherry pick the pieces you like and cut out the parts that you don't like in the scripture. As soon as you pick up the scissors with your Bible, you have become God instead of him. You've become your own standard of truth, which is a very scary place to be. I don't want to be my standard of truth. So that's number one, is consistency. The second thing is there is no satisfactory explanation for, for, for evil, the current evil that we live with, outside of a highly organized evil organization. Where in the world did we get genocides? Where in the world did we get world wars? Where in the world did we get all the false religions and all the confusion for people's faith? Where in the world did we get the mental health struggles that that we've gotten? Where in the world did we get some of the theories that come into academia and confuse us? Where in the world did we get serial killers? Where in the world did all this highly organized evil come against us? The scripture gives us an explanation. And then the last reason I would tell you you ought to believe in the enemy is because it does you no good not to. If you are in the woods and a grizzly bear is charging you down and you choose not to believe in the grizzly bear, it does not do you any good. Your unbelief does not help. So here's what we're going to do with the rest of the message. I'm going to take you from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to look at the war. And in order to give you a sense of where we're at in the whole big story of that war, I'm going to break the war into four acts, just like a play. Act one, two, three, and four. And we're going to start right away with act one. And there's going to be a lot of verses. You are probably not going to be able to write them all down because there's too much. Did I mention there's a lot of Bible today? There's a whole lot of Bible today, but I just want you to see the story get told. So write down what you want to, write down what you might want to look up later, but don't write down so much that you're not in this with us. First off, the royal family in power. Satan is giving control. Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now this is right away. God creates men men and women, okay? And you've got a king and a queen. They are like our royal family. They are the first and God gives them dominion. Now that's a Bible word that means control or rule. So they have rule over the world. Why do they have rule over the world? Because God gave it to them. It is God's uh, world. God gave them rule over it. That's a big deal that makes them our royal family. Now in the midst of that, You see that God made them in his likeness. We talked about that back in January, the Imago Dei, that we are made in the image of God and we have dignity and worth. Every single human being has that because we come from Adam and Eve and we have the Imago Dei. Now, some of you guys know what happens right after this. God gives them that dominion and then the fall happens. The serpent comes and lies and Eve eats the fruit and then Adam eats the fruit. And what they do in that moment is they stand against God and they stand with the serpent. Now, we don't know exactly how this went down, but their dominion, their right to rule the world, they handed to the devil. They gave it to him. 
Now, we don't know, number one, did they, as part of that transaction, did they give it to him? Was it part of the fall? Was it part of the curse that God said, because you've aligned yourself with the enemy, I'm going to align all of creation to his rule? Did God do that? Or did every single person and every single choice that we ever make that's driven by our own selfishness and darkness, do we all give Satan rule all the time? I don't know. But he gets it, and you're going to see that in the Gospels later on. By the time he gets to Jesus, he says, I'm the one who has all authority, and I can give it to whoever I want to. You'll see that moment later. Okay, so next, even though Satan is in charge, he's on a leash. This is in Job. Job chapter 1, verse 10, there's this moment, some of you have read it, where um, it shows the throne room of God, and And Satan goes into the throne room and he talks to God the Father about Job. And Job is this righteous man who loves Yahweh. And Satan says, if if only you would let me tempt him more, I can drive him away from you. The only reason he's a worshiper of Yahweh is because you've made his life too stinking nice, too easy, too pleasant. Let Let me twist him just a little bit. Then he'll fall away. And he says this, he says, you have always put a wall of protection around Job and his home and his property. Who put the wall of protection? God did. Satan says there's there's protections that God puts up, whether you see them or not. You have made him prosper in everything that he does. Verse 12, all right, you may test him, God said, the Lord said to Satan, but don't harm him physically. So God comes in and says, you must ask my permission. And when I give you my permission, you may go this far and no further. That's the kind of sovereign control that God is still having over this world. Even though Satan is given that kingship and that dominion, it's only on the leash that God has him on. So just don't forget that. So what is Satan out there doing then with this control that he's got? Um, War? Influence over armies, influence over rulers, influence over authors and influencers, academics, influence over false religions, influence over your families, influence over those that create new technology that drives mental health problems in our culture, uh, influence over child abusers, influence over, over sexual assault cases, rapists, influence, influence, influence. See, sometimes we believe what Hollywood, again, gives us, that that heads are going to spin and they're going to spit out pea soup if Satan's involved. And that's not what the scripture says. More what Satan is often doing is he's influencing humanities and he's spreading his darkness through lies, through temptation. He's got other ways. So our sin gives Satan power, and this is the primary way. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's what the New Testament calls him. He is the prince. He is the ruler of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, this is an interesting little moment in the scripture. So this is after the cross. And what he's saying here, this is Paul talking, he's saying, listen, Satan is still in control of those people who have rejected Jesus, the sons of disobedience. He's still their prince. But now there's a new kingdom where Jesus is in charge. And he's like, and the thing that you do that makes him in charge is you're being dead in your sins and your trespasses. The more you rebel against God, the more power you're giving to Satan. And that's the way that it works. So the chief weapon that he has against God's people before the cross and after it is to get you sinning and to get you in a place of guilt and shame. Emotion, mental, spiritual. He comes to control us and the source is our guilt. It's your past. Have you ever felt that? He comes to you and says, (laughs) you know what you've done. Not general, not what they've done. Let's talk about your week. Let's talk about your top sins in your life. Let's talk about what you did those years ago that no one talks about. You don't admit to anybody, but I know. And what he does is he he brings like an arrest warrant for your soul 
and on it, he's got everything. And when he holds that against you, your guilt and shame, you don't have great arguments back, do you? Because not, not only does he say you did these things, but he's got this way. Here's, it's, this is where it goes from guilt to shame. Guilt is you did all the things. Shame is you are the things. I, I did dark things, but he's not going to stop there. He's going to say, you are darkness. You're a son of hell. You're a daughter of hell. The reason you're doing these things is because you belong to me. Do you hear the dominion? You're part of my group. <laughs> and then we know the damnation that we deserve for the things that we've done because we know justice works. It works on a human level, and we know it must work at a cosmic level. That if I've done all these things, there must be judgment for the things that I've done. There just has to be. Otherwise, there's no justice. So he gets us, and then he causes us to fear death. <sighs> Act two, Satan fights Jesus. Yeah, it doesn't go so well for him. I'm just kind of ruining the ending for you. But he's going to fight Jesus. Right away, he tries to kill Jesus early. Do you remember the Christmas story? Jesus is a baby. Matthew 2, Herod sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. This is the influence of Satan coming into King Herod, who was an evil king. And there's this moment with the wise men, and they tell him that they're going to find Jesus. And so Herod sends soldiers to kill everybody under a certain age because he doesn't know which one's Jesus. And he knows that when Jesus has come, he doesn't know exactly who Jesus is, but he knows it's a bad deal. He doesn't understand. And don't give him too much power and don't give him too much credit. He doesn't understand exactly how the prophecies of the Old Testament play into who Jesus is going to be. He just knows he's chosen of God. I mean, angels sang over his birth for heaven's sake. You think Satan saw that? Of course he did. And so he tries to have Jesus killed. And if you know the Christmas story, you know Mary and Joseph and Jesus have to escape to Egypt where they're not under that influence anymore. Pretty crazy stuff. So again, Satan understands he's a big deal. And just you got to have this for the plot. We don't know what Satan knew. Some scholars don't think that Satan understood that he was God. Some scholars think that he, he just thought, well, maybe he was an angel in human form. Maybe he was just a special person, like a special prophet, who was going to have a big impact on this whole dominion war. But he didn't know he was God. Or some, some people think, some scholars think, well, he, maybe he knew he was God, but he thought he was going to take dominion forcefully like Satan would have. He's going to come in, he's going to try to fight against the kingdom of darkness and take back what was rightfully his. And so Satan lines himself up for a war, not for a cross. Because the cross is the twist, and he doesn't see that coming. So he tries to kill him as a baby. Next thing that he tries to do is he tries to pollute Jesus with sin. So here's his egotistical offer. Luke chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. And the devil took Jesus and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Now some of you guys know where this happens in the timeline. Jesus has just started his ministry. John the Baptist just baptized him. Jesus goes off in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and he fasts and Satan comes to tempt him at the end of the fast. Tempts him three times. This is the big one. And he says, listen, you can have dominion. All you gotta do is worship me. You can have the dominion that you want back, Jesus, because again, he doesn't get it, right? And notice what he says, because this is very important theology here. He says, all this authority and their glory, it has been delivered to me. So Satan's admitting the truth. He did not wrestle the authority of this world away from anybody. It was given to him. He also has no right to the authority. It was delivered to him. It was handed to him by God or by us. So he's saying, I've got it. So I can give it to whoever I want to, which is true. But Jesus is going to take it in his way. Next, because he can't pollute him, he can't kill him as a child, Jesus keeps trying to kill him all through his adulthood, putting a stop to Jesus. Look at all these things. Luke 4, right at the beginning of his ministry, he reads a scroll in Nazareth, and they try to throw him off a cliff. 
They plot to kill him in Matthew 12. They try to stone him in John 8. They try to stone him again in John 10. They try to arrest Jesus multiple times. A lot of times there's just crowds around and they're like, well, we can't arrest him with all the crowds around. Or they go to arrest Jesus and moments happen where they will say, well, Jesus just kind of like floated through the crowd somehow and invisibly got away from them. We don't know how. Jesus just did it. Here's the thing. Every time Satan tries to come against Jesus, Jesus gets away. What a battle this is. Jesus does not die until Jesus is ready to die. So they try to arrest him, and Satan enters Judas finally in John 13 to start the motion going forward of Passion Week and the final week of Jesus' crucifixion. But just notice the sheer number of times that our enemy tries to put a stop to Jesus. Next. Jesus predicts it. He calls it like Babe Ruth called it. You guys know the old story? Yeah. Babe Ruth gets up in baseball, which is America's sport, by the way. He gets up in <laughs> baseball, and he points to the stands. It's the prediction that's crazy, right? So Jesus predicts it. Jesus in John 12, verse 31 says, The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Amen. That's, that's Jesus. He knows exactly where this is headed. And he says, when I'm lifted up, that is, that is his um, uh, terminology. It's his phrasing for saying crucifixion when I'm lifted up on this cross off the ground. At that point, he says, the ruler of this world will be cast out. So you've got dominion now, Satan, but you're going to be cast off your throne as soon as I die. I mean, Satan should have raised the white flag right there, but he doesn't get it. He still doesn't get it. Love that. Next, Satan is still on a leash. This is Luke 22. This is kind of like Job, Job, not Job, Job. But you see it again. Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. He says, Simon, Simon. This is all about Peter. Simon, Simon. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. But I pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So, so sift like wheat. Here's the process they used to do. Is you, had this, uh, you had the wheat kernel, and then there was chaff around it. You didn't want the chaff in your bread, right? So, so they, they did this thing. That the, the chaff would, would blow away with the wind and stuff. So they would filter it, or they would sift it like a winnowing fork or something like that. And all the chaff would blow away. And he's saying, Satan came to the Father in the throne room just like Job. And said, I want to sift Peter. And I want to filter his life. And I want his life to be left. And I want his faith to be gone. Satan had a plan for Peter. And Jesus comes in in his sovereignty and his power and says, yeah, you were in that throne room, but so was I. And I pleaded for you in prayer, Peter. And I said, this is what he wants. And I know he's on a leash. And so I asked God, the father, nope, I want Peter's faith to be okay. And he's going to deny, and he's going to weep bitterly, and he's going to come back to me, and I'm going to restore him and forgive him, and then you're going to come back and strengthen your brothers, Peter. And when Jesus says all of that, he doesn't say if, he says when. Do you see it? End of verse 32. So when you have repented, Jesus is in absolute control at all times. Crazy. Next. Jesus gave Satan a moment or an hour. Some of your translations are going to say an hour. This is your hour when darkness reigns. This is your moment, Luke 22. And this is Jesus talking to the soldiers that came to Gethsemane to the garden to arrest him. And this is what he says to him. He says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. So, so I, I love what Jesus is saying here. He's like, he's like, me and the Father got together and decided to give you a moment. We kind of made a plan, and this is the moment you get. It starts now in the garden, and it's over when I say it's over. You got to hear the sovereignty. You got to hear the control that Jesus has. Again, Satan should have raised the white flag already, but he doesn't. Act three, Jesus disarms Satan. And Satan did not see it coming. This is the funniest verse today, right here. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. 
This is Paul writing about all of this later. He says, God's plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began, but the rulers of, the, of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. So Paul's coming in later and he's saying, not only was Jesus in control, but this whole cross thing, it was God's secret twist ending. It was God's secret plan to defeat Satan in a way that he couldn't fight against. And Satan didn't know it was coming. Paul said it right there. So Satan just barrels right into the battle thinking he's about to kill God's guy. And win. He's not about to win anything. Mark chapter 15. This is, this is the cross. I want to read this to you. Would you guys stand? Would you guys stand out of honor for God's word? If you're at home watching this live, would you stand as well? This is just a, a simple way for us to show honor of, towards such an important moment in the life of Christ and what he did for us. So I want to read this to you. Verse 22 says, and they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered Jesus wine drugged with myrrh, but Jesus refused it. And why did he refuse that drink? Because it was meant to dull his pain. And Jesus was not going to let any of the pain be dulled. He was going to feel all of it for us. Verse 24, then the soldiers nailed him to the cross and they divided his clothes and they threw dice to decide who would get each piece. They're treating him like a common criminal. They're doing away with his clothes. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. A sign announced the charge against him, and it read, the king of the Jews and two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Now, just real quick, the sign that was posted above him, uh, th that was a Roman custom when they crucified someone. They would take what you were being accused for, the crime that you were being accused of, and this is what you're dying for, and they would post it above your head. They called it in the Greek, a titulus, a titulus. That's the sign. That's your judgment posted above your head. His judgment was that he had claimed to be the king of the Jews. And how dare he? Because Caesar was supposed to be. Verse 33, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why does he feel abandoned? We believe because God could not be in the presence of sin. Amen. And as Jesus took on the cross, it was the sins of the world, yours and mine, that were placed on him. They weren't just placed on him in a, in a I don't know, kind of lofty, kind of over-spiritualized way. He actually became guilty in that moment for what you had done, for what I had done. And because he was guilty, God could not be in his presence. Verse 37, then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he explained, exclaimed, this man truly was the son of God. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> that curtain was the old curtain in the temple, the Jewish temple, where they had the Ark of the Covenant and that Holy of Holies room where that was used to have the, pres the very presence of God in it. And so normal people, sinful people could not walk into that room, the Holy of Holies, because God was too pure and they were too impure was the idea. And so in this moment, when Jesus dies for us, it says that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. God himself is symbolizing to every single one of us, the way is clear. You can be in my presence now. It's an amazing thing. Next, Christ the victor. This is Colossians 2, and this is, this is the central passage this morning. I really want you to see how Paul sees the victory of Jesus on the cross. What Paul's doing is later on, he's coming back to the cross, and he's trying to explain to us, like during that time of darkness, as Jesus is breathing his last breath and suffering for us, this is what was really going on in the spirit realm, even though people didn't see it. Colossians 2, it says, number one, he forgave us all our sins. All of it, say all. all. He forgave you all your sins because of what he did on the cross. 
All of your past is all forgiven right there at the cross. Second, verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, Jesus has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, that phrase right there, the charge of our legal indebtedness, you look at the Greek, that's titulus. What Paul's saying is, your arrest warrant that's got everything you've ever done wrong on it, it's got the Ten Commandments on there because you broke all of them, right? Me too. It's got everything. Jesus took the whole thing and he nailed it to his cross. Because what did that symbolize? It symbolized, this is what I'm dying for. This is what I'm accused of. And once I'm done dying, all of this is paid. So Paul comes in and says, every single one of you, you all had a record of indebtedness. And it all got nailed to his cross. Verse 15. And then he says, And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over them by the cross. So Jesus forgave you. Jesus took care of all of your debts. It's all paid 100%. And because it's all paid, guess what? Satan doesn't have a weapon against you anymore. Amen. Get it? Because yeah. his weapon was your guilt. His weapon was your shame. His weapon was that you're going to be judged and you ought to be afraid of death. It's all gone now because he just died for you. Satan's got no weapon left. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. Now that phrase, made a public spectacle, that's another Roman idea. Here's what they would do. It's, it, what he's talking about is a parade. They would do this in the, in the, in the Roman world. Uh, they would have a Roman general who would go off and fight a foreign power, and he'd defeat the foreign power. And then he would come back and have a parade in Rome in front of the citizens. Why? Because the citizens paid taxes to pay for that military campaign. And he's proving that, that look, this is the result of everything that you paid me. But part of, that, part of that parade that they would have is they would actually take the conquered king and they would drag him all the way back to Rome and his family and his servants, and all the soldiers as prisoners of war that were still with them, they would bring them all back to, to, to Rome, and they would march through the city, and they would sing songs over these conquered people. Can you imagine that? And then Paul comes in and says, that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. That whole kingdom of darkness, Satan himself, was spiritually being paraded in front of the entire spirit realm. You didn't even know. But he had so fully defeated Satan, everybody in heaven and on earth could see it. Fully defeated. Revelation. Last act, the toothless one. <laughs> Revelation 12, the scene in heaven is, is described here in Revelation and there's actually multiple falls of Satan in the book of Revelation. Um, some scholars think there's up to four of them. And based on how you read these different prophecies in Revelation, you might associate different falls of Satan with different ones. I believe this particular fall of Satan is the fall that he experienced when Jesus died on the cross. I've got good reasons to believe that. Feel free to disagree with me. That's fine. Revelation 12.10, here's how it describes it. It says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, <clears throat> it has come at last. Salvation and power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of who? His Christ. Guess who's got authority now? For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down. That's the enemy. That's Satan. He's been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. He is our accuser. And they defeated him, verse 11, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's the cross. Therefore rejoice, O heavens. And you who live in the heavens rejoice, but terror will come on the earth and the sea. Now, this is weird. So the angel's up there celebrating, right? This is a party. And he's like, everybody in heaven is thrilled. But woe to everybody else on earth, because Satan's coming down to you. For the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. 
So the toothless one, <laughs> I call him the toothless one because it, it, it's like that serpent in the garden, but he has been defanged. His primary weapon against us has been taken away from him. So he can gum you for sure. He can lie to you. You can believe his lies. You can give him power if you want. He can tempt you, and you can give in to him and give him power if you want. But he has no teeth. He's an angry elf. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was sitting there in my notes, and I'm like, he's an angry elf. I wrote it. I literally wrote it. Couldn't help it. But notice he said, but he's angry because he knows his time is short. So this is the current state of our enemy in Act 4. And this is where we are right now, by the way. In Act 4, the enemy has no teeth, but he's mad. And not only was he defeated on the cross, but the cross didn't just take his primary weapon and power away. The cross was also proof that he was headed for hell himself. Because Jesus just signed his death warrant. Because he's not going to win the war and he knows it now. And so that drives his toothlessness and his, his destiny are driving his anger. You ever see a wild animal that's got no teeth and is mad at you? And, and there's some of you are like, but Satan comes against me so much. Is, it's his anger. Yeah, he's furious. I get it. There's Tom, he feels pretty furious to me too when I'm fighting him. I tell you what, preparing for this message today, yeah. I've been planning to mock our enemy all week long. You think he's come against me? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. But he's come against me with his anger, not with his teeth. And there's a difference because Jesus won that for us. Okay, here's where it gets practical just a little bit before I let you go. This is sealed. Your past, if you are in Jesus Christ, if you've decided to be in his kingdom, it is sealed. If you decided to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, make him your Lord and King and say, I want to be forgiven by you, which is a massive step for any human being to take, by the way. But if you've decided to take that step, you are here in the kingdom of God, not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. But I, part of the reason you got to know this here on Easter is because even though that's 100% secure and he's got no weapons against you anymore, there's some of you that are still struggling to believe that you're saved. There's still some of you that you struggle with assurance and you, you know you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, but you still have doubts about whether or not you're going to make it to heaven. Just got real. And even though you know what the Bible says, and even though what you, you know what Jesus has said to you, there are still days that you're like, yeah, but I know what I've done. And I'm telling you, that's the lie of the enemy, and he's got no teeth. Yeah. And once you realize he's got no teeth with you, not really, it, ch it changes the whole picture. And there's some of you that are like, but I have not done enough religiously and I haven't come to church enough and I haven't given enough and I haven't, I haven't done all this stuff in order to counteract the past. Do you ever do the justice scales on yourself? Do you ever believe that? That's a lie. Amen. Because Jesus paid it all. That's right. You don't have to counterbalance anything. And so that's the truth. And so you got to walk in the truth today and stop believing him and stop giving him power. Yeah. You need that. Draw a line in the sand today. Be done with that. As Colossians 1.13 says, God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We are saved and safe. Yep. Romans 8.37, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Do you hear the enemy and all that? Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, Hallelujah. if you know Jesus. 1 John 5, 13, last verse. John says, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And I just want to call you out. 
Some of you have gone to Jesus believing, but you don't know. And you've stayed in this place of not knowing for sure. And John wrote his entire book so that everybody who says they believe in Jesus could also know that they're saved. Know that God's got them. It is God's will for you, not that you stay in doubt, but that you know. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, you gotta say it. If you would believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you would believe you will be saved. Would you guys stand? If I could ask for quietness in the room, we're going to pray a very important prayer right now. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What's God doing? He's setting us up and just saying, hey, your soul is yours. Do you want to give it to me? Your soul is yours. Your life is yours. Do you want to to surrender it to me? Because if you come under my forgiveness, if you want that, if you want me to be your Savior, your God, I'll come right in. The passage in Revelation says it's almost like God's just knocking at the door. And all he wants you to do is turn the doorknob, let him in. So I'm talking to two groups of you. Some of you have never asked God to do that before. And I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. We're going to pray this prayer. And the, the words of the prayer are not magical. You just, you just need to talk to God. It's a conversation. You're doing business with him. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're in a spot where you're like, man, I've prayed that prayer before and I've tried to walk with God, but I've stayed in this place of doubt and I've believed, but I've not known. I've believed and and I, I've just stayed in this place of just haunting doubts. I want you to draw a line in the sand today and say, I'm done with that. So if you bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to give you a tiny step to take. No one's watching. Nobody's counting. Nobody's going to track you or stalk you, I promise. But if you're going to pray this prayer with me right now, I would just like you to raise your hand briefly. I'm not going to give you a ton of time to do it, but just raise that hand. I just want to know who's praying with me right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're all going to say these phrases together right now. And God knows your heart. God knows God knows where you're at spiritually. So just talk to him. Dear Lord Jesus, you are the king. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for defeating the enemy. Thank you for taking my sins, nailing them to the cross. I don't have to pay anymore. All my guilt is gone. All my shame is gone. I want you to change my life. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive me. Make me clean. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.